we actually do have some time now for questions. If anyone has any, yep. Um, just off, uh, Peter, are you aware that there's a trial of, um, coming up in September for two weeks? I think it's going to be on Christmas Island itself about the Christmas Island riots. Uh, the trial, some of those coming to trial, I wasn't aware of that, that that was going to be happening at some, happening at some point. And, and yeah, because there are a ton of witnesses. Well, I mean, and those guys will be totally screwed over because, <laughs> I mean, we've, we've seen some trials of people uh, in previous riots and they were just absurd and, um, I mean, Marcus might want to talk about that. He has attended some of them. Would you like to comment, Marcus? Uh, well, I suppose only to say just how much, I'll go this way soon after 20 years. <laughs> only just, I suppose to add that uh, a lot of those guys that were caught up in that, um, one important thing to say that not everybody was actually involved in it. They just tended to get not only people they saw on camera in the vicinity of things happening, but anybody that they thought might be able to identify people, or they just kept in detention. Some of them, even after they were being found to be refugees and had their security clearance. They just kept them in for extra months because they just wanted to say, well, we might want to have to ask this guy who this person in the camera is and we're not letting him go until we finish. And so people were kept in for months and months each time. The fact that it's only now going to trial, more than a year after that's happened, um, is largely due to the government lawyers uh, because they kept turning up and having hearings to start and the Commonwealth of Defence for the government, um, or, sorry, prosecution, didn't have their cases ready. So they had to keep delaying and delaying it. So here these people are, again, being denied, even once they've entered into the actual legal system of Australia, um, still being denied kind of due process by being prolonged detention, um, yeah, and just having a lot of the information held from them. And a lot of people, and we've you know, gone and visited people who've been in this situation before. Uh, I think the one, the guy, the one of the town guys when we were visiting, when he got charged with um, participating in the riot, because he was holding the stick. And I remember the judge actually saying, I realise that you were holding the stick in self-defence and you weren't one of the uh, primary agitators committing any of the crimes and weren't intending to commit any like violence. But nonetheless, you were holding a stick, that constitutes a weapon and that does mean that you were participating in the right, therefore, I find you guilty. So it's, it just becomes absurd. Um, just to add to what Marcus is saying, I actually did sit in on the, uh, on the trial of um, some Tamil guys who were charged over stuff that happened on Christmas Island. I can talk about it now because it's basically done and dusted. That trial really opened up my eyes for a whole bunch of reasons. I remember an Australian Federal Police Officer, who I always thought were the smarter of the police fraternity, or whatever you want to call it, get up and say, OK, I interviewed this Tamil person on such and such a day, um, and I cautioned him, and the lawyer said, do you think he understood the caution? And the AFP officer replied, oh, no. And it, all the lawyers looked at each other, because basically that means that it was good for us, because it meant that that whole testimony was just out the door. But the AFP officer just had no idea. I mean, the Tamils were sitting there, I remember when one bit, they were looking at each other and looking at me, and in the break, I quickly yelled out, what's wrong? And they said, we can't understand what the interpreter's saying. The interpreter's from, from Tamil, uh, Tamil Nadu. It's like basically having a Glaswegian in there, you know, they can't understand what this person is saying, so they have no idea what's going on in the court. And I think that was the case for a lot of the, for a lot of the proceedings. These guys who were being tried did not know what was going on. Now that is, to me, is like a, a profound failure of justice. I mean, and at the end of it, even though they, some of them did get convicted, you can see that the judge just thought, what the hell is going on? Because to add to Mark is saying about the stick, one of the guards admitted to picking up a stick, you know, so why wasn't he charged? I mean, the guards not meant to pick up sticks and start swinging them around either. So, I mean, the whole thing is, is ludicrous, and it was absolutely caused by Serco's mismanagement of the centre, the overcrowding of the centre, the fact that no one in there knows what's going on. Am I going to get a visa? Am I not going to get a visa? You know, the system is just not transparent. So you basically wind people up and wind them up and wind them up, and when they explode, you charge them. And this is kind of the way the system works. Uh... Yeah, Mark. Um, my, my question isn't directly related to mandatory detention, but then what, what, what I was wondering is um, to uh, canvas a wide range of opinions on this. 
uh, in the scenario that uh, those are countries like say Afghanistan do attain peace, then is there any opposition to allowing refugees to go back there and um, rebuild their nation because at the end of the day their families are still there? Well, this has been the, this has been the preferred method by most refugee act activists is that if people come here seeking asylum, they get a permanent visa, so now they're safe. You can rebuild your life. If at some point in the future it's your choice to freely go back to your own country to help rebuild it or something, then you're free to do that. You know, if you feel it's safe enough to go, you can go. But um, you know, you should never be in the circumstance of being forced to go or being unable to find somewhere safe to, to hold your life. And of course, this does happen. In fact, some people, when the Taliban fell, some people did go back because they it turned out to be a false hope. But they hoped, oh, the Taliban are gone. Maybe it's going to be better. Maybe I can help rebuild my country. And uh, went back, and of course. Ten years later, it's not only better, in fact, in some ways it's worse. <laughs> and there's a new wave of refugees from Afghanistan, and now even Pakistan, because the Taliban are also active in Pakistan, killing a lot of the Hazaras and Quetta and stuff like that. Marcus had a to contribute. Well, just because that's probably an important question, because Alexander Downer during the last week said that Afghans should just go back and stay there and rebuild their country. You can't focus on the politics and rebuilding your country until your family and your immediate safety is secure. <laughs> So if we provide the visas and people have, even if family safe, even if someone goes, okay, I can go back and participate in politics and all the rest of it because I know my family safe and if anything happens, I can get back out pretty quickly, so. And, and you've certainly seen that with, say, um, Kosovars and um, Bosnians and things who were fled from the former Yugoslavia when, during the civil war there. And then after several years when it's all settled down, some have gone back and, you know, and it's safe. But in the meantime, but, you know, they were given permanent protections and um, were able to get on with their lives. Uh, I think it's worth pointing out about Afghanistan as well, is that there's been forced uh, repatriation back to Afghanistan, which has ended up in people dying. Like when they actually did surveys of refugees that were sent back under the Howard government scheme where they got a grant of like $1,000 or something like that and sort of, you know, passage back to Afghanistan. A number of them, up to 30 of them went missing. Um, you know, they were kidnapped much as soon as they arrived, disappeared. We never heard of again. So I think that the the whole um, I mean, and that's that was supposed to be this fabulous program on behalf of the Howard government in the early years of the Afghan wars. So now everything's settled and fine. Now we've gotten rid of we've dislodged the Taliban. Our fabulous uh, intervention uh, into Afghanistan. And I think that you know it sort of highlighted the horrors of forced migration in terms of back, but also the um, the horrors of mandatory detention because of, you know some of the refugees who took the packages. Took money, we're so desperate, so despairing of ever being able to settle in Australia without the sort of harassment and intimidation of the Department of Immigration and Australian Mandatory Detention System that even though they fled Afghanistan and didn't believe any of the hype about uh, how great it was supposed to be, they still uh, took the money and went back and then suffered uh, for it. So I think that at every step of the way, there's all these horrors of mandatory detention, which I think that the campaign has done a really good job of highlighting and, and trying to combat. And I really liked. Uh, Peter's presentation tonight, particularly its focus on the activism, because I think that's been one of the things that sort of stopped all of us going insane over the last 10 years, and we've been greeted with one more, you know, atrocity heaped up on top of the last one. Um, and I think the fact that the campaign's had some successes in pushing back some of the worst aspects of mandatory detention, and I think, you know, being able to relate to that consistent third of the population who, through thick and thin, have a reasonable position on refugees and who don't give in to the racism and all the shit that comes from the top. I think that's sort of what we're going to try and keep mustering and keep focusing on when we, in our future uh, actions. Uh, one, two, three. <laughs> um, yeah, just, just want to take for a reminder to start historical policy. Back now, that's easy to forget. One thing I just want to say about the successes that I, I think we really need to value is the fact that you, you the refugee activists, have been really the first ones to expose Serco successes um, yeah. and put them on the public record. Now that that has really been picked up substantially um, beyond just the refugee uh, contract. Yeah, that's why I forgot about uh, it. And you guys, you guys have been at the front line of documenting the evils of Serco and, and that has had a global impact on I me. Mean, just an example on the weekend, some of you may be aware of the fact that um, in Britain, um, Serco was trying to take over police services. Um, there were 
attempts by Serco and G4S to get police services in West Midlands and Surrey. Um, a community campaign prevented that from happening and a lot of the evidence they used, they got from Australia, about Serco's and G4S's excesses in the immigration detention field. So the, the material you guys got and get on the public record then has a global benefit because Serco is operating globally. So it's a, you know, you guys have exposed that um, to a global audience. Well, and it's not just in respect to the detention contractor Serco. And the one thing I had forgotten to mention in this presentation was that Australia initially was the only country and the first country to use indefinite mandatory detention without charge or trial. And so that's why Australia was really a critical background against this dramatic undermining of 800 years of legal tradition in the British justice system, but also the undermining of the Refugee Convention and undermining of protection of refugees internationally. And um, we haven't been as successful in that because Canada has now picked up Australian policies. And a couple of years ago, they, there was you know bu bureaucrats and apparatchiks and whatnot from Canada invited to Australia and given a tour of the system and how it all works. And now that's been transplanted into Canada, something quite similar to what we've got in Australia. And the idea is cropping up in Europe as well, using, you know, shunting people off to remote islands to process them and stuff like this. Um, so it's not just about what's happening in Australia, this policy. We need to be pushing this back because it's undermining the international system of refugees and, and, and the legitimisation of racism and the politics of appealing to a lowest common denominator. Yeah. Um, uh, did you see um, Q&A last Monday where they had uh, Malcolm Turnbull on and for the first time uh, someone from the Liberal Party talked about um, push factors instead of all the pull factors. Um, do you think that it's important when you're talking about um, uh, the asylum seeker or uh, uh, human right refugees, the solutions that you talk about doing something about the push factor so that you stop the people from coming instead of stopping the reasons, um, uh, the pull factors, because the pull factors are always going to be there. It's like cause and effect, or, or, or are we ever going to be able to have a government policy <coughs> that does say, oh, let's do something about the push factors, um, or throw money at the push factors instead of throwing money at pull factors such as stopping boats coming or turning the boats around as if that was some kind of um, big policy. Um, someone want to take that one? <laughs> There's a few, a few yeah, ones there. Um, well, yeah, I certainly agree we should take up the push factors and why they're there. I think what's particularly important, and Peter touched on this when you go back to the origins of the mandatory detention policy and the federal government at the time wanting to present it to Cambodia as a safe place, We've seen it's reproduced over and over again now with Afghanistan and Sri Lanka. And they're different, in a sense, from the conflicts that people fled in Europe, in Bosnia, in Kosovo, uh, in Croatia, and before that, post-World War II migrants, where that could be sort of pictured as a, as a war on the other side of the world. Um, Sri Lanka and Afghanistan in particular, the Australian government is very involved in these conflicts and is selling a lie to the Australian people. And to keep selling that lie that, that, that um, Afghanistan is moving steadily towards peace, our uh, troops are all doing the right thing in Afghanistan, um, the flip side of that is arguing that Hazaras and others fleeing Afghanistan um, are not worthy of our, our safety and asylum. And I, I do think we have to um, take up that argument. Another thing I just wanted to touch on quickly is the whole issue of temporary protection visas, because that's also part and parcel of this argument by the government that um, even if um, these places are not safe now, um, you know, we can, we can provide people with a temporary sanctuary and force their return at such a time as we deem them to be safe. Um, and uh, we've seen the terrible consequences of that temporary protection visa policy where asylum seekers are denied the right to work, um, they're denied the right to sponsor relatives to come to Australia, so those relatives have to make their way on dangerous boats. Um, and this is, this is a, a, a very immediate threat for returning this policy that I think John Brown will have to be taking up as well. Uh, Peter, and then Alex. Hmm. 
Yeah, thanks for um, the presentation, Peter. I, I guess one of the things that I wanted to go back to was the comment about the positive mental health um, consequences, impact of activism and seeing people protest. Now, we've got a few mental health workers or professionals and people who visit quite a lot. I can't remember after which protest it was, but to give, I mean, I'll apologise if it's a bit distressing, but it's quite a, well, it is a mental illness factory system that we have here. Um, maybe people can speak to some of those points. I know after one of the protests, somebody got a message from a refugee in detention basically saying that the protest and knowing that there is support and solidarity out there made such a difference to them that they actually stopped cutting themselves for a week or two weeks. And, you know, that's, that's an important aspect of what activism can bring. And I don't know, I just wanted to raise that and maybe if other people wanted to speak to that point. Um, yeah, sorry for the people that have gone to cancer report for us, heard me say these stories before. Uh, I'm a social worker and provide some uh, mental health support for people in detention. And uh, constantly, the, the activism provides support and a coping mechanism for people in detention like nothing else. Uh, Counselling doesn't work. I mean, counsellors are there to try and get people through another day, another day to try and stretch it, but counsellors even find it difficult because they know that, yeah, they might, help, they might help people hold on for an extra month, an extra two months, but they know they'll fall apart at some point. Counselling is not like a doctor fixing a broken arm that's over. But what activism does, people have lived in a situation where they've been told, you're not welcome in the country that you were born in, and you've been pushed out. You go along these countries along the way where you're constantly being under threat, being caught by police, um, attacked, detained, deported, and then they get to Australia and they're here for one year, two year, and they're locked up in a prison. They're called by number, not by their name, and they've got you know these guards that are joining into the racist um, kind of rhetoric of the war and abusing them. Plus, they're watching TV and they're seeing how this is presented on Today Tonight and a current affair. To then have some people who are on the other side of the world from where they were born turn up at the gates and they're sitting there and they hear people shouting, Free the refugees, Azadi, which is freedom, and call it fighting for them. Just from all reports I've had from people I've met, it just meant the world to them, and it did help them survive. Uh, and we've had constant reports of um, when we went to Curtin. You know, people said to one of the visitors, uh, "Today, this, this weekend, the angels came, and they knew our names." Uh, when I went up to Curtin to uh, do some mental health support and stuff, and I remember meeting these guys for about five days. And they sat their heads down, they didn't smile, they could hardly talk, and it wasn't until on about the third or fourth day where I met these guys, um, it's now the second time, we got a relationship, the guards went around, and they went, oh, you're one of those guys that came up on that protest, and I was like, I'll oh, keep it quiet, because they don't know that I'm there. And they just fought their faces with up, they started laughing, and that day was the best. They said, oh, the guards didn't know what to do. He said, usually they, and he goes, usually they give out maybe, you know, five, ten visas at a time, like every couple of months. He goes, that day they gave out 75 visas. He said, they were just coming out people going, don't join the protest, you'll get a visa, you're out next week, don't join my community. He said, it was just immense. And the, just the sense of connection to getting back their humanity, that they mattered, that was the thing. People came to the centres and they went, we matter. In a world where I've constantly been kicked out of my country or my home and been called a number, these people are reminding me that I matter. I just wanted to make a brief comment about this. Um, like I think the link between the ALD, which I think is actually the key issue in this whole issue, and then I mean, in, in Peter's presentation, he talked a lot about how the racism is what's driving this policy, and like he talked a lot about the history of Pauline Hanson. I wanted, to, I wanted to mention that because I think a lot of people get confused about that kind of the, the outright expression of the sort of most out there right wing sort of racist views. And I actually think that a big part of the solution to this is actually combating the, the mainstream racism of Labor Liberal, but especially the mainstream racism of Labor. And so, so just, to, just to unpack that, in, in talking about the example of Pauline Hanson, the first thing to remember is she was originally endorsed as a Liberal campaign. And the Liberal Party knew what her politics was. Right? And there was, she made these out over the top, you know, unbelievably racist comments in the, in the pre-process election campaign 
but and then the Liberals were forced to this endorse her. But after after it's too late to have a name, the Liberal Party name taken off the ballot papers. On the ballot papers, it said Pauline Hanson Liberal Party, and a lot of the actual local Liberal Party organisation actually campaigned for her. Then um, she gets up in Parliament and makes her first maiden speech. And the very first comment that John Howard makes is, I am proud to be a Prime Minister, but now I have this freedom of speech. By now, under my Prime Ministership, people are now confident to say these sort of outrageously racist things that, um, uh, that, that Pauline Hanson came out to say. And then, of course, you know, Pauline Hanson basically, put, you know, basically pushed the envelope and said a whole lot of things that the, the, the mainstream Howard government could not have said. It, would have, it, it just was so out there to sort of think that those kind of policies could be put forward by a mainstream. In fact, as, you know, as Peter sort of clearly explained to everybody, he was like, this is, this is unconscionable, we couldn't possibly imagine that something like that. Only a couple of years later, the Liberal Party had endorsed those policies. One year. Sorry? One year. Yeah. Um, so that, that, I think, so shows the role that she played for the mainstream. And we like, the media, the media, put, the media, um, profiled her big time. She was like, she was put forward as, you know, if, you're, if you've got a problem with the labour removal, she's the alternative. No one else was put forward as, you know, Pauline Hanson is the alternative. Um, and that, that went on all the, way, all the way along, until it got to the point where um, Pauline, you know, One Nation won 11 seats in the Queensland state elections, and that, that really began to threaten the National Party base. So basically the coalition was threatened by this kind of, you know, oh, things are getting a little bit too far. And it's at that point that the media kind of basically turned on her, sort of pulled things in, undermined the basis of her support. It was around about that time that Tony Abbott that the, the, the legal attack on whether her party was officially registered directly, blah, blah, all those sort of things. It was like the mainstream basically pulled her into line when it, when it became a, a challenge and a threat to the mainstream. And um, it, it's, but, I mean, I, so I guess the point I'm making is, you know, every, every step along the way, it was, the Liberal Party mainstream that actually basically gave her the space. I mean, the other thing which is just, no, like a coincidence, but it's an interesting little fact, the same day that Pauline Hanson gave her maiden speech, Bob Brown gave his maiden speech. Pauline Hanson's maiden speech got a lot more media attention than Bob Brown's maiden speech. This is sort of like, you know, this to give you the sort of, you know, the, the sort of comparison. And to me, I think what that brings back is, it comes back to, you know, if we actually want to stop this policy, because a lot of people sort of make it and say, oh, well, you know, look at all the, the sort of wildly outrageous things Tony Abbott says, oh, thank God Tony Abbott's not here, and you get all these things on Facebook, all this kind of stuff. And it basically lets the Labour Party, which is the current government, off the hook. And when, when you look at the Labour Party's record, Labour Party pulled the policy in. <laughs> That's the first thing. Then all through the Howard years, the Labour Party, the Labour Party didn't challenge it. They just went, you know, like, in, there obviously were people in the Labour Party who challenged it, but the, the, main, you know, the main leaders of the Labour Party just basically followed, you know, followed it to the right. Um, and, um, you know, and then of course, since, you know, since, you know, Rudd and, Rudd and, um, and, and Gillard have been in as Prime Minister, again, it's the same thing. I mean, they're just following the Liberals to the right and not... Yeah, and the Lucky Greens are any now... Sort of, any sort of challenge to it. So it's like, um, yeah, that, that's what I'm going to say. But I just thought it's worth unpacking that history of, of Pauline Hanson because a lot of people make the mistake of thinking, oh, it's all about the far right and the sort of, you know, the extreme right. Whereas, in actual fact, in my opinion, the, the, the key to actually solving this problem is actually challenging the, the racism of the ALP. And my opinion is that's why it's actually, well, to, uh, one other thing of, you know, success of activism that needs to be pointed out. When, uh, at the time of the Tampa um, dispute, well, so the Tampa, um, when, when Howard made the issue of the, of the Tampa, the refugees in the Tampa, Howard's action at that point had about in excess of 70% support in opinion polls. But by the end of the Howard era, era, like it was like sort of 34%, those kind of figures were, were coming in opinion polls. And that activism eroded, eroded, eroded that, you know, that, that support for those sort of racist policies. Um, and basically made it, you know, put a lot of pressure on the government in those last few years. There were those, you know, a lot of, you know, People were released, all the other things that Peter mentioned, um, and you know, the, the easings of some of the, the worst aspects of the, of the implementation of it. Um, that was that was you know from the, from the pressure of, of the, the mass movement on the streets. Now our, our difficulty is precisely the fact that it's a Labor government that is implementing it, which means a lot of the more moderate organisations are just um, not wanting to come out there so boldly and say, look, this policy is going to end. But of course, that's why. Um, 
what I actually I just want to I wasn't mainly going to talk about Pauline Hanks, but I did want to say something about that. It, as I remember, it's not actually true that Pauline Hanks' main speech was when we all found out she was a racist. It was actually during the election campaign she was actually expelled from the Liberal Party because of some racist statements that she made, and I can't remember at the moment what the issue was all about. Um, there was also during that same election campaign, and even well, possibly about the same size bureau around racist statements made by the National Party candidate. Um, but the National Party guy didn't win, so he was never heard from again. Um, and there was a, uh, I don't know if anybody in this room remembers, the Confederate Action Party. The Confederate Action Party was a sort of precursor to One Nation. Um, just a sort of bunch of right-wing dogs, basically, in Geraldton. Um, but the story, the rumour that I've heard, and I've never heard this confirmed, is that the Confederate Action Party got $10,000 from Northcrite and Brown to carry their operations on in Geraldton. Um, Pauline Hanson, her supporters, um, one of the Davids, I can't remember which one, worked previously in Tony Abbott's electoral office. I mean, there was a lot of Liberal Party connections. But the big shock was, that she got elected, she was standing for the safest Labour seat in Queensland, she got the biggest swing of the night, the 22%. She came from nowhere and the message came of racism sells, you know, racism is popular. Racism had been, racism had been considered uh, the stuff of the, the loopy fringe in, in the, you know, the five years previously. Five years previously it's seen things like the uh, and it was true. It's sort of partially true that the Labor government had an anti-racist agenda. It was sort of theoretically true. There were lots of holes with that in practice. But you had seen things like the native title legislation had passed Parliament, um, Keating's Redfern speech and so on. Uh, so I'd say there were lots of people trying to break through and start a racist government. <laughs> leader that they found words. But what I wanted to mainly talk about was something else actually, um, which is that is about the whole political climate that this um, asylum seeker debate, if you can call it that, is trying to create. <coughs> One of the things that really strikes me about this time around as compared to all the hysteria around the Tampa is that at least when this started, there actually wasn't, outside of the circles of politics and journalism, there actually weren't a lot of ordinary people really concerned one way or the other yeah, about like, the boats turning up. That's right, yeah. yeah, like the whole scandal of things like the Oceanic Viking was completely manufactured. The first time around, the media had actually hit a nerve with the tamper and, and the hysteria before then, but this time around, nobody cared. Um, so I wanted to think about, well, what's the agenda driving this? One of the things I noticed is, if your only source of information is the mainstream media, and for a lot of people that's true, you might think that the overwhelming number of people coming into this country are asylum seekers. There's hardly any coverage or news or information that would reflect the fact that asylum seekers are actually a tiny percentage of migrants. What's Something like uh, well, one percent or something. 2011, 2012, uh, sorry, 10 to 11 financial year. Um, Short-term air arrivals to Australia was six, more than six million. Yep. And um, but how many how many migrants like the people who would end up long-term long-term long -term long -term arrivals? Long-term. So arrivals. people who were staying for more than 12 months or more. Yeah. So they're either temporary migrants, like maybe they've got a work visa for three years or something. Yeah. Or maybe permanent here yeah, was. Um, uh, 600,000. Versus how many asylum seekers? About 6,000. So about 1%. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. And, and there's a lot of people being brought in from uh, non-European countries. Um, there's a lot of people from the Middle East coming here. There's a lot of people from China coming here. A lot of people from the EU coming here. And the sorts of visas they're coming in on are things like 4th by 7 visas and student visas and so on that have all these really complex, arbitrary rules. Um, I had a meeting today with one guy who's from China, and he had to cancel my last meeting with him because he had to go back, because he went to immigration, and he'd stuffed up something with his visa, and he had to go back to China to reapply to come here from China. Like, it's absurd. 
In fact, it meant the project he's working on got delayed by three weeks while he was in China trying to sort out his mess. Okay? Um, but what I see happening is that the reason for all of these complexity, things like 457 visas happen the more outrageous because uh, they're essentially indentured servitude, is to try and bring in people basically for cheap labour and then is to create, this policy is to create a division within the community so that Aussies who, you know, white Australians who wouldn't be very, fairly, they're to only watch the TV, will see, well gee, there's you know, so many people from, from overseas here. Well, they must all be these refugees. Tony Abbott's on the TV all the night, and, and the media's promoting them. Of course, they have, they're all getting a free ride, and Gillard's been soft, and whatever. So, to try and create this division, um, and then have these people on these uh, immigration visas that are really limited, um, often in really poor paying jobs, in a very precarious situation, and split them off from any solidarity from the broader community. I think we need to keep this in mind, and personally, I'm actually, I mean, I don't have a lot to do with activism anymore and so on, but I'm actually personally quite worried that the amount that's been pumped up by the media, it could get a lot worse, it could get a lot more out of control, we might see race rights and this sort of stuff. Okay, so, uh, keep up the hard work, please. Okay, we might actually wind things up um, now. Yeah. Uh, Grant, do you want to make one? Last. Okay. I think, yes. I think, <laughs> I think, yeah, I think the overall success of, um, um, you know, the most important success of um, the refugee campaign, uh, like RAN and uh, RAN's sister groups um, in the eastern states, um, is is that, uh, you know, it provides an alternative um, for people, for that significant amount of the population that opposes both liberal and labour policies. Uh, and you know, um, and we cut against the grain. Um, you know, so while we work with um, people like the Greens um, and some Labor uh, Labor members who are sympathetic to refugee rights, um, you know, I think it, it's um, that thing of um, being somewhere public, having a public action, drawing attention to um, Labor and Liberals, um, you know, atrocities, um, and providing providing that alternative for people who are frustrated with this. Who want, um, who want some action and will not sit idly by while people run detention centres. And I think, um, you know, to, um, to be heading up to Northern um, is, is a perfect example. Northern's an hour away, we'll be there for a couple of hours. Um, and we want to get a couple of us loaded people along, um, people who um, want to go to this new prison that's been built, which will eventually hold 1,600 people, um, and, um, and say, we will not stand for this. Um, and so I would encourage everybody um, to um, you can get a ticket here tonight in the information. We've also got um, Mythbusters and things like that, um, Mythbusting sheets, um, and to sign up your name, um, get a seat on the bus, um, and come with us to protest this. Um, and I also just want to do a big reply with we, uh, for RAN itself. We have our meetings on um, Monday nights um, at 6.30 at the Activist Centre, which is on Aberdeen Street. Um, and we, um, you know, we want new people for the campaign. So we want, um, you know, if you're interested in getting involved, you don't have to know everything, you just have to be passionate about asking and end to manage